everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Alex Bruins, a product applications engineer with Danfoss, and today I'm going to introduce you to the Plus One Connect portal. To get started, you'll need to choose Sign Up, enter a valid email address and your additional information, and choose Submit. You'll receive a confirmation email at that account. Uh, once you confirm that, you will then be able to choose to log in. So I'll go ahead and do that. Once you get logged on, the landing page will be a map and all your devices. Uh, if you don't have any devices, which if you just signed up, likely you won't, you'll need to choose to go to device management. It's really simple to get started as far as getting registered and data plans purchased. For example, you choose to register your device, choose which device it is, for example, a CS100, give it a relevant name for your application, and then it, there's the EID and serial number. Both of these are located on the label of the device. So once you enter those, you choose to register device. And if you had entered everything correctly, uh, you'll get a confirmation immediately from the portal. Uh, to get a data plan to apply to that device, uh, you choose buy plans, and that's going to go ahead and take you to the marketplace, which we've already discussed. So now that the device is registered and you've applied a data plan to it, uh, you need to actually configure it to do something, right? So you want to go to configurations. There's very flexible. There's a lot of flexibility with the configurations. This is really cool stuff. So, for example, if you have a DBC file, uh, it's a common data formatting of uh, uh, CAN messages that uh, many of your customers may use. So you choose DBC file. Go ahead and add one. I've got this example here, so I can save that. So now I've got that DVC file to help with my configuration if necessary. Of course, some of your colleagues might have already developed one, or your customers, uh, in which case you can go ahead and choose to import that configuration. And lastly, you can start all from scratch and create an entirely new configuration. So, for example, we'll do that today. So. For device settings, of course, you want to give this uh, configuration name so you can keep track of it. You want to choose a node ID that isn't going to cause any issues with any other controllers on the bus. And then there are two CAN bus ports, so you can adjust the baud rates appropriate for your application. Uh, there is some ability to configure the data logging frequency. Uh, and then by default, you can see that it's either after a period of 300 seconds or 20 messages have been captured. You can include your position information. So if I choose send GPS coordinates, I can include the altitude, heading, and speed. I can also adjust the time interval that that's captured. The device does have two multifunction inputs. So if I go ahead and choose the multifunction input, there's a lot of flexibility with what I can do. So I can actually have a digital output. So if I want to turn something on remotely, uh, a multifunction input. This can be thought of very similar to our controllers, so it can take resistance, frequency, and so forth. And then there's clamp 15, which gives you the ability to have the device monitor the ignition of the machine. And if it turns off, you have some user-defined period of time before it actually shuts down. And then it goes into its sleep mode, which consumes very little current. And in addition to that, you also have the ability to adjust it to cyclically wake up based on a user's defined period. So for this example, we'll just show a multi-function input. So, you know, if you have a fairly simple machine, uh, but you want to, you know, monitor charge pressure, you could install, you know, a pressure sensor on there. And of course, give it that name, uh, choose the signal. In this case, it would likely be an analog voltage input. Uh, choose the range. Again, the, the time interval or frequency that you want that message to be captured. And then you can apply an offset and multiplier to give it uh, uh, engineering units so it's human readable. And then, of course, uh, in this case, it would either be bar PSI, for example. And now for the CAN bus, which is incredibly easy to use, uh, similar to the, the, the example up above with the multifunction input, 
you could create a custom message, you know, so if you have a proprietary message on your bus uh, that is out of the standard, you can, of course, fill that in, give it its ID and masking that you want to apply the time interval. And then, of course, what bits and bytes it's actually to be captured. And then the engineering um, offset and multiplier uh, functionality as well. But alternatively to that, we have the whole J1939 library in here. So if you know what ESPN or SPN you want, you just go ahead and type that in, just like Google. And oops, I'm typing Google. Got me excited there. So for example, there's engine speed. You can choose that, and everything's completely populated for you. And you've also got the ability to adjust some masking. Uh, perhaps there's multiple controllers that have this message. You just adjust the source address right there. Uh, choose the relevant CAN bus that uh, it's attached to. And lastly, the, the time interval or frequency that you want to capture that. And as I mentioned before about the importing of DBC files, so this example one that I have, so all those, those messages that I included in that example file, they're right there. So those could be custom ones, for example. So once you got this configured to your application, you can choose to go ahead and create. Once you've done that, we're going to need to apply it to device. So I'll go here to devices. And I see my device that I activated. I want to go over to here to actions and choose to do a configuration update. So if I did that, I would have that file that I just created and I'd be able to go ahead and apply it to that device. So now we've configured the device. It's capturing data and sending it to the web portal. So there's a, several different ways to look at this data, one of which is you know, real-time consumable data, so dashboards. So we So this first dashboard that you're seeing here is just to give you an idea of how many widgets are available and how flexible this system really is. So whether it be text or embedded videos, uh, as well as widgets just to customize the appearance. And of course, you just have your real-time data coming up there, whether in numerically or in a gauge type form, as well as having columns and line charts. Uh, it includes you know, the weather at the location of the device, uh, and then you can even add historical data widgets so that you can quickly glance and see what, you know, what the activity has been that week. Now, this is incredibly easy uh, to use. So just for example, I'll go in here to edit dashboard. So as you can see, uh, you can just grab these widgets and resize them and configure them for whatever signals that you'd like. Uh, these are also Boolean conditioned. So based on certain behaviors of the machine, the entire dashboard could change. You know, if there's a, a you know, pressure, uh, Delta is too much over a filter, you could have a video showing how to uh, change that filter as well as a link to go ahead and order it to pop up. So pretty neat and pretty flexible. So we jump out of here. So not only just, you know, this example of what's available, uh, here's just kind of a cool, simple, you know, but quick to see what's going on with the machine uh, uh, dashboard. So. So in addition to the dashboards, uh, we have all that data that we're, you know, uh, collecting over whatever period of time, and that's being stored on the servers. Uh, so you can go ahead and, and chart that data out. Uh, so there's a couple things I'd like to mention about the charts. Uh, one of which is that's really cool is that you can chart multiple assets simultaneously. So if you've got machines out in the field uh, doing, you know, similar type work. Uh, you can compare their productivity or see how the different operators are, are doing and so forth. Um, but in this example, I only have the single asset here. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab that. And we can grab a couple signals that, that uh, you know, perhaps a customer has called in and said his machine is not behaving as you would expect. Uh, and in, the, in that case, you could go and, you know, look at yesterday's data and and choose the signals that maybe uh, uh, give you insight into into insight into the behavior that the customer is describing, uh, and then it's as easy as just choosing to go ahead and graph that, right? 
So as you can see, there's your data. You have the ability to zoom in and take a closer look. Now, for example, if we did see something uh, unusual, uh, you have the, the ability to go ahead and just retrieve that data. And the reason you might want to do that is perhaps you're not the, the hydraulic systems expert, uh, but one of your colleagues is. So you, know, you can go ahead and, and immediately download that data and go ahead and shoot that over to them in email, for example. Or maybe you are the expert and you've got other tool chains that uh, you might need to evaluate that, like VAMOS or MATLAB. So then you'd be able to go ahead and, and import that. So we've covered the dashboards, uh, the charts, uh, and then of course reports. So it's really nice to be able to automate some of this stuff that you historically need to keep track of, right? So creating reports are real easy. Uh, all that's necessary, you know, give it a relevant name for, you know, our application or, or, or whatnot. Uh, choose the bucket size that you'd like. Then you have the ability to choose the frequency that you receive it, whether it's daily, weekly, or monthly. You know, an example would be, you know, maybe every Friday afternoon uh, you get a report of the productivity of, you know, all the machines in your fleet, for example. Um, and all, it's as easy as choosing your asset and uh, what signals that you'd like to be reported. Uh, and go ahead and save that. And then you're going to periodically uh, receive those messages based on how you've, you've set up the frequency. And so what that would look like when you do ultimately get um, a report is, so it looks like this. So it's, there's my demo data or report. Uh, and if we scroll down here, uh, we can see the actual data that's been collected over that period of time. So really slick and, and easy to use. So of course you can't have a legitimate uh, telematic solution without having geo tracking baked in. So we'll go ahead and take a look and, and see what we can show here. Uh, I talked to a colleague and apparently we were doing some testing a couple weeks ago. So let's see what they were up to. I believe it was the 27th. Let's go ahead and start bright and early. And we'll go to end of day or thereabouts. So there we go. So let's go ahead and search that. All right, looks like we have a track. And this will be at our advanced development center in Ames, Iowa. So out on the test track. Uh, it was a trenching activity, I believe, or digging activity, so we had a, not a great deal of tracks to be laid right there, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you can see where that piece of equipment was operating. Of course, you can click on the various waypoints and see uh, information about altitude and, and uh, heading and so forth. So, of course, with the addition of geotracking, we have the geofencing. So it's real easy to set up. Uh, you can simply choose to draw a circle, or you can do something more advanced like a, a polygon. So, for example, if I just want to, you know, create something, a shape for my uh, geofence, I can go ahead and do that. So that looks like a star, so we'll go with that. And we'll stick with that. So go ahead. Of course, we want to enable. We can adjust the severity of the notification, so we'll go ahead and put that high. Then we can choose whether it's uh, the notifications are put out uh, during an exit or an entrance of the uh, geofence itself. So we'll say exit uh, for this one, and then of course we'll choose that ADC machine. So we'll go next uh, live notification. So this is basically uh, here on the web portal interface, you get a pop-up bell notification immediately when that is set off, as well as an email notification at uh, whichever account you'd like. And there we go, completely done with the geofence. Very simple to do. All right, next I'd like to go ahead and jump right into the administrative side of the house here. So go ahead and do that. Uh, I just want to demonstrate how simple this really is to do. So we'll go ahead and hit the sitting or settings icon here. Uh, we'll choose groups and we'll choose to add a group. Uh, we're going to keep this real simple and call it oops, child group. All right, and we'll make the parent group my Dan Foss 
default group. So go ahead and save that. All right, there's my child. I'll go ahead and hit the pencil to edit it. I will choose to assign some devices. I will get these devices from my Danfoss default parent. And I should have several to choose from. I do. I'm going to go ahead and assign the R1200GS. And it is assigned. All right, great. So next, I will go to the child group that I just created. And now that I'm in that group, I'll go back to settings and I can create a role. So I will add a role. So what a role is, is like it sounds, it's uh, basically permissions for what this person that I'm going to add uh, to have visibility of this device, what they can actually see and do. So sample role for my child group. Uh, we do have some templates already created that we anticipate uh, would be pretty common permission setup. Uh, so for example, say admin everything for this one. So you can see it's populated the majority of permissions that are available. And I'll go ahead and choose save. All right, so now I have the new example role. So now that all that's required, now that I've got a new group, I've assigned devices and I've created a role. I go over to users and I choose to add a user. So all that's needed here is that whoever you're adding needs to have a plus one connect portal. You'll put their uh, email address in there, of course. Uh, assign whatever role you had created. And in this example one, it's basically admin. And then go ahead and create add and, and they will now have access to that new group. All right, the last topic I'd like to cover today is the notifications. So if I jump into my Playhouse group, I'm going to go ahead once again, hit the settings icon. I'm going to choose notifications. I'm going to add a notification. So engine speed notification, we'll say. Uh, we'll give it description. Uh, we choose the severity of the notification. Uh, we'll go ahead and use the R1200GS again. Go ahead and choose next. All right, so we'll create that rule. So first of all, yeah, we'll go ahead and use that multi-function input. Let's say if the multi-function input is greater than 10, and we'll, we can combine this with an enter, or we'll go ahead and leave it as an end. And I did mention engine RPM, so there we go. So multi-function is greater than 10 and engine RPM is less than 1800, I shall get a notification. So we go ahead and hit save. I'm gonna go ahead and assign myself to this notification. All right. And I need to choose what kind of actions I want to happen. I wanna be notified by mail as well as I want to be notified by the bell here in the portal. So that's as simple as that. Uh, this notification has been uh, created. So you can see that uh, right here. Engine speed, ready to go. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, what I covered today. There's obviously a lot more. Uh, we've created a very powerful platform here that... Uh, I think we'll have many happy customers out there. So I hope you enjoy your day and thank you for your time.